Sounds good. Thank you so much, Anthony. It's uh, a pleasure to, to be joining you guys. This is, it's always a lot of fun to, to do this. Um, you just have to, you'll make me the co-host so I can share my screen. Oh, yes. And, uh, and we'll just, uh, let's jump right into it. So just to introduce myself a little bit, you guys may have heard of me before, maybe not, uh, it doesn't really matter, but what I do, I work for the biggest cost segregation company in the country, Madison Specs, uh, we're based actually in New Jersey, although we have a national footprint working in all 50 states. And um, we do a number of other services as well. You may have heard of Madison Title and 1031s, et cetera. But we're gonna talk all about the magical world of cost segregation today because it's something that so few people know about. And it's not that complicated. It's just, I think for a lot of people, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you guys can, uh, can share with me. Uh, there's only seven of us here. So put an answer in the chat box, open up the chat box there and, and answer. Um, my question to you is when you hear taxes, does your brain just shut off and think, hey, that's for my accountant? Or do you, if that's the case, write number one. Or if you think, oh, taxes, yay, fun. Let's learn all about it. I, I love taxes and put a number two. Um, so if you put a little number one in there, if you feel like I don't even want to think about this or two, let's, let's talk all about taxes. So much fun. So I see we got a pretty mixed crowd over here. I don't know, for me, for a long time, it was, it was number one, definitely like oh no, well, taxes. I, I'm not a CPA, but you know, I play one on TV. So that's, that's really what I do. I mean, I, uh, I work with CPAs in our company. We have a whole, whole firm that this is what we specialize in. And even though it is a tax related subject, it's really just a tiny little part of the tax code. And so a lot of CPAs themselves don't even know this exists or, or don't know much about it at all. Um, believe it or not, I mean, I've spoken literally to um, hundreds upon hundreds, if not over a thousand CPAs in the past few years. And um, yeah, unfortunately, Uncle Sam is your silent partner who, who if you don't know about conservation, is taking, taking his fair cut. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the maj vast majority of accountants that I have spoken to over the past few years don't even know what conservation is, literally. Um, I, I've given webinars for hundreds of accountants for uh, you know, continued education uh, courses for accountants uh, to get their CPE credits that they need to get the accreditation. And I literally would take a poll, you know, like four questions, is this subject you, you have never heard of before? I know I've heard of it, but don't know much about it. You know, like a few options. Number three, I'm, I'm very familiar with it. Or number four, I'm an expert. But basically, every single time I did these webinars, which literally each, each webinar would have over 200 accountants, at least uh, over 70% uh, would be either in, I've never heard of it, or I, I heard of it, but don't know much about it, literally. So don't be afraid if, if you've never heard of it, um, or you don't know much about it, because you're in the, in the likes of, uh, of even most accountants. So let's just jump into it. First, we're going to understand what, what depreciation is, okay? And depreciation is a great topic. Um, it's a great tax deduction. But cost creation is really just an advanced form of depreciation. That's all it is. It's nothing more. It's just taking depreciation and, and maximizing the benefits of it to all the different components of the building. Okay, we're going to talk very much detail how this works. I'm talking about what's the benefits of doing this? Why should you be doing this? Why not? Why do some people do it? Some people don't do it. What's bonus depreciation? Very hot topic, uh, especially now when we know what's going to be happening with you know potential changes. Um, but as of now, in the current uh, state, we're in bonus depreciation is an awesome thing. It's probably the greatest thing that ever happened to real estate investing uh, over the past 50 years. Who should be doing this? When should we be doing it? And most importantly, what is a real estate professional? This is a really important topic. We'll do a little bit of case study and we'll wrap it up and take questions. So um, without further ado, and if you do have questions, please put them in the chat. I'm happy to answer um, or it's just small group. You can just turn on your mic and stop me, you know, <laughs> feel, free. feel free. Don't, uh, nobody be, uh, you know, ashamed over here. What is depreciation, right? It sounds negative, but it's really a tax deduction. So it's a theoretical uh, tax deduction, which is based on the concept that things go down in value as time goes on, right? If you, you know, you have a, a car and you drive it off the lot, you know that it goes down in book value, even though it's intrinsic value didn't go down. So it's with real estate. In fact, real estate is actually appreciating. It's going up in value as time is going on. Nevertheless, you get a tax deduction. The day you purchase a property, 
based on the purchase price, okay? It doesn't matter how much money you put in, it matters how much money was spent. How much money was in the purchase price, you now are allowed to take that entire value minus the land, land we'll talk about in a minute, doesn't depreciate, but that entire value you can now take as a tax write-off, okay? Income tax deduction, literally, the whole thing. Just, you can't do it all at once, okay? You have to split it up for commercial properties over a 39 year period, for residential, including multifamily, over a 27 and a half year period. That's what's called depreciation deduction, okay? Doesn't mean it's depreciating, doesn't mean it's going down in value because it's based on, again, not just when the building was built, but when you purchased that property. Not only that, when you sell it and a new buyer buys that for, you know, you bought it, sold it for, uh, bought it for a million dollars, sold it to another guy three years for $10 million, they now get to take that depreciation tax deduction, start over that 27 and a half year schedule based on $10 million deduction, okay? So it's, it's very um, subjective to the purchase price. But there are things in the property that actually depreciate on a faster rate, not just 27 or 39 years, but on a five year schedule, seven or 15 year schedule. And the job of conservation is to identify what those things are, segregate those costs into different categories and take those faster depreciation deductions on a faster rate, essentially getting you bigger tax deductions. Let's just take a, a simple equation here. Okay, let's say my billion dollar property, um, pretty simple take 15% for land, that's an average, that's the national average, could be 10%, could be 60% in California, some places like that, it's crazy amounts of land value. But simple depreciation is like this, your depreciable basis, and most accountants know what depreciation is, and they're doing what's called straight line depreciation, which means they're taking that entire lump sum and take dividing it up by 39 or by 27 and a half, and you're getting a tax deduction every year, 21,000, 30,000, depending if it's commercial or residential. Now that's great, don't get me wrong. Depreciation rocks, it's awesome. You get, you just made money from your rental properties, you're allowed to like take a huge tax deduction. Usually it's, it can very well be, you know, up, up you know, half or, or even the full amount of the income from your property that year, the depreciation deduction is actually offsetting that, um, negating that. So it is actually a really great thing, but, Conservation is a way to accelerate a large portion of those, getting doubling or tripling or even quadrupling, in some cases, your depreciation deductions over the first five years, which is not only totally wiping out any tax liability, meaning, let's translate, what's tax liability being wiped out? What does that translate to? You make money and you don't have to pay taxes on it. That's what that means. So it's not only doing that, but oftentimes getting you more deductions than you even have income which I will see later on if you're a real estate professional can be very beneficial to you. If not, you don't lose it. You just get to carry it forward and use it in future years. Um, so let's just kind of take a step back, understand what the fundamentals are over here. As I mentioned before, it's depreciation on steroid. That's all it is. It's taking depreciation deductions, but how do you do this? Like what's the process? I mentioned it's an accounting thing, but accountants don't know about it. Why is that? Because it requires an engineering component to it. Okay, the IRS and the Conservation Audit Techniques Guide says that it must be performed by someone who's qualified in building or construction engineering. Okay, so you need an engineer, not just any engineer, but an engineer that understands the tax code. And they come into a property, identify every tiny detail of that property, how much square footing of carpeting is there, you know, what type how many cabinets, how much square footage of, you know, how many fixtures are there, how much, what's the lighting, every tiny detail and all of those things, we tally up what the amount is and then what is the value of each of those, depreciate them separately, raking out the entire components of the property into different depreciation schedules, getting huge deductions, increasing your cash flow. Very simple. That, that's all it is. Okay. Is everything clear so far? Any questions up until this point? Let me take a little drink, sip of water here. Everyone get it? High level? High level, pretty clear. Yeah. I'm going to break it down. Cool. I'm going to break it down into detail. So on this next page over here, we'll see in a couple examples. As I mentioned, the building depreciates on a 27 and a half year schedule, 39 year schedule. The building and the structure of a property, that's so. What we're doing is we're breaking out and we're identifying things that are not structural in the property and therefore depreciate on faster schedules. Those two, and so the bulk of the property and the bulk of the depreciation deduction is still going to remain in the building. 
okay, in the structure. So that's the walls, floor, roof, windows, doors, you know, main electrical uh, utilities, those things, kind of things, those are considered structural and that's the main value of a property. However, you know, 20, sometimes 30% can be allocated to these other depreciation schedules. So the main two categories are what we see here on the page today. Five-year property and 15-year property. Five-year property is personal, casual property. These are things in your building, in your property that are not structural. They may be even attached to the building like carpeting or, or, or fixtures or even, you know, wall coverings, things like that. Many things may be attached, cabinets, countertops, but they're movable potentially. And so therefore they depreciate the value of those assets on a five-year schedule. Okay, we're tallying up what all these things are. You can see here it's a list. This is not an exhaustive list. This is actually taken directly from the case study of a multifamily property we're doing later on. But you see here, these are very common things you will find in a multifamily property that depreciate on a five-year schedule. Okay, the second category is this 15-year, what's called land improvement. So as I mentioned before, land does not depreciate land improvements however do which means anything on top of the land so if you have landscaping you have any type of pavement or asphalt a parking lot sidewalk driveway anything like that the value of that concrete guess what there's value there and we're depreciating that we're taking that value and taking as a tax deduction at a faster rate than you would have normally done okay and a lot of things basically anything outside the building so we're talking fencing signage uh you name it all that kind of stuff this is this is incredible because what this does is it allows you to take bigger again like i said in the earlier years of ownership a larger portion of tax deductions which is increasing your cash flow so essentially i mentioned apartment building you get 20 to 30 percent here's a list and this is not an exhaustive list but it is a pretty typical average of reallocation of assets as i mentioned land you always have to separate but whatever's left you have the building which is the main thing and then what's being reallocated Okay, that five and 15 year property for apartments, it's usually somewhere between 25 and 30%. That's an average for auto dealerships. You know, there's all kinds of properties can get stuff. Retail, hotels, more like 35% on average. Again, some more, some less, depending on what's in there. Manufacturing, heavy manufacturing, those kind of things. There's some properties that are literally off the charts, like mobile home parks. You see on the second to last um, row over here on this chart, MHPs, mobile home parks are off the charts because the majority of what you're buying there is actually land improvements. In many cases, you own uh, you know, the land and you also own the concrete, but you may not actually even own the homes. The tenants own their own homes in, in a lot of cases. So you what, you, what are you buying? It's being split up between the land, some structural infrastructure stuff like utilities and, and you know, septic and things like that. But what's on top of the land, concrete, landscaping, that all depreciates on a 15 year schedule. And so that's accelerated at a much faster race, literally 50, 60, I've seen up to 80% in some cases. So people ask me, you know, I, I need to buy a property before the end of the year because I need huge tax deductions and we're going to get to bonus depreciation very shortly. You'll see, you can actually take the entire amount up front in the first year. Um, so people will ask me, what, what should I buy? And so the answer is always a mobile home park. You know, if you want to operate something like that, most, most people don't want to, but if you do, guess what? huge amounts of tax, uh, potential tax deductions just by buying that in the first year. So just to recap over here, on average, on an after tax basis, now what we say after tax basis is that again, cost segregation is lowering your taxable liability. If you made $100,000 of rental property income and you have $50,000 of, of depreciation, you've lowered your taxable income by $50,000 which means you're not gonna be paying tax on 100, you're gonna be paying tax on only 50 if your tax rate is 25%. It, again, you're lowering it, not, you're not getting a $50,000 uh, refund check. What you're doing is lowering your tax liability that lowers your net present value of that. So we're reducing that, we're increasing the cash flow. And like I said before, we are not creating deductions out of thin air, but what we're doing is we're front loading those deductions so you can use them now. Okay, that's called the time value of money. Just borrowing from your future self, really. Like you're not necessarily, and you may not even own this property for 20 years or 30 years. So we're able to take these deductions now when you can use them, cash flow allows you to reinvest. You can make more money. And let, listen, unless you trust Uncle Sam to invest your money better than you can invest your money, 
then there's no reason not, there's almost no reason not to take those deductions when you're allowed to take them. Okay, very interesting fact over here. Cost segregation is actually considered the proper way to depreciate your property. That's right. By putting your whole property and lumping it together on a 27 and a half year or 39 year schedule, you just take a little bit each, each year is considered an improper way of depreciating your property. Even though everyone does it, even though the vast majority of accountants, that's what they do, but it's still considered the improper way to do it because you're supposed to actually break down the assets with cost segregation. However, the IRS doesn't require you. Well, why don't they require you if they consider it the proper way to do it? Very simple answer. They don't, they're not going to go out of their way to tell you that you have to pay less tax. You have to figure that out on your own, right? It's one of these, these conundrums, right? Why did, you know, how much tax do I owe, right? See, everyone's seen like that meme, right? Like how much tax do I owe? Uh, you ask that, I don't know. Well, how am I supposed to figure it out? You figure it out. What happens if I get it wrong? Well, then you, you, you're penalized by, I'm not kidding. well, then why don't you just tell me how much I owe? We know how much you owe, but we're not going to tell you, right? <laughs> Same thing over here. We know of all the deductions that you could potentially take, but we're not going to tell you what they are, right? You got to figure that on your own. And so that's part of the education process over here. We can figure out these type of tax benefits, these strategies to, you know, to just get us uh, over that hump to, to pay less taxes. Um, so who should be doing this? Like, who is this for? Do you have to be a corporation? Do you have to be a real estate, you know, investor? For? Anyone can do it. If you are taxable, if you have a tax liability, as long as you're not a nonprofit organization, you're not a government entity. And uh, I would point out this because it's very common now that a lot of people are investing from retirement accounts, okay? Self-directing their IRA or, or using a 401k plan, which is, you know, QRP, those kind of things, qualified retirement plan. Those oftentimes, many of them, Roth IRAs, for example, are not taxable, okay? They're in a tax shelter, so the money that's being made there is not taxable. Therefore, you don't get depreciation deductions for, for that income. So their cost creation is totally irrelevant. So important to note, um, if you are investing from that or if you are a syndicator and you're taking investors that are, are doing that, they're not gonna benefit from this whatsoever. So, you know, you're gonna have to figure out what's the best structure, you know, to do that. Is it worth it to do it just for one? You know, some people, others not gonna benefit. That's something you should definitely have a discussion with your tax advisor to do that. But anyone can do this. And if you buy a property in an LLC, for example, which is just, a, it's a flow, flow through entity, which means it's you, okay? So whoever owns a portion of that property, you know, if you're owning equity in that property, you get a, pro a portion of that or a proportion of that of how much you invested or how much is your equity. That's how much depreciation you get. Okay, so let's just keep it simple. Let's say you have two people that bought a property together and they're joint owners. Each one owns 50% of the equity. Each one is gonna get 50% of the depreciation, whatever that is. And it's gonna flow through equally. Uh, and so too, if there are multiple members. There are certainly other ways to structure deals. People can do it, but that, you know, it's not for, for our uh, intensive purposes here today. It's just uh, important to know. So now probably the most important topic we can talk about tonight, which is the real estate professional. It's a very hot topic and it's a really important one because if you have this status, you now like have a golden ticket, which means you can basically uh, take tax deductions beyond your rental property income. Let me take a step back here. Rental property income is schedule E, okay? It's considered passive income. Passive income is taxed in a different way than your active income. When you have a W-2 job, it's, it's taxed differently. So depreciation deductions that you get from your rental properties are considered passive deductions. Those deductions hit first and foremost, the rental property income, okay? So if you have one rental, or you have multiple rentals, doesn't matter. The depreciation is gonna be used first and foremost to offset any income you have from your rental properties, okay? Now, if you have any depreciation beyond your rental property income. Let's say you made $100,000 from your rental properties, right? A good year. And you got bonus depreciation, we're gonna talk about it in a minute, and you got a million dollars of depreciation this year. Well, guess what? $100,000 of your income is gonna to be totally wiped off, no taxes on that whatsoever. However, what are you doing with that extra $900,000 of deductions? What happens with that? it's considered a passive loss. Now, if you're not a real estate professional, if you're just, you know, W2 job, you do whatever, it doesn't matter, you have what's called a passive loss a limitation. You're not allowed to use those passive losses this year. It just carries forward, you can use it next year. However, 
if you are a real estate professional, and now let's get into it, you're gonna be able to use those extra deductions. You no longer have a passive loss limitation. You can use those extra deductions to offset any other active income you or your spouse has um, without any limitation. Okay, so I'm gonna repeat that again after I define what the real estate professional is. So I, either you or your spouse needs to have the status, only one of you, you need to make two qualifications. Number one, you need to spend more than 50% of your time in the real estate trader business, which basically means you cannot have a W-2 job. You need to have a full-time real estate materially participating in rental activities somewhere or another. And the second qualification is you need to have 750 hours a year. Not a lot of time, about 15, 16 hours a week if you break it down every week. However, you do need to be full-time, okay? Meaning you can't be doing something else more hours. And those are the two qualifications. Only one of you needs this. So if you have one spouse who's a high earner, it might be worthwhile to have the second spouse become a broker, become you know involved in the rental property activities. What are those activities that qualify? There's a lot of them, and this is not this is directly from the IRS. Um, so you can see here they're saying if you're in the rental property trader business, you're doing either developing, redeveloping, constructing, reconstructing, acquiring, converting, renting, leasing, operating, managing, or brokering property. So if you're a broker, the activity involved in any of those things and all of them collectively should be tracked and you can then qualify for this status. Again, why is this so important to qualify for this status? Because you can do cost segregation, again, get huge tax deductions way beyond your income from your rental properties and any extra deductions, any passive loss can then be applied to any other source of income, active income as well. Okay, this is huge. This is probably like the best thing ever. And this is really the reason why real estate moguls and you know we, we read about Donald Trump and, and Jared Kushner in the paper, right? The, the press is trying to paint them in a bad light, but they're just playing by the rules, right? They just, they just know about these, these great rules that they're able to take these huge tax deductions um, and, and get that status. So it's all about learning the rules, playing by the rules and, uh, and figuring out the strategies to make it work the best. So there is one exception just going to mention this quickly. There's one exception of someone who is not a real estate professional. If you're making less than hundred thousand dollars a year in adjusted gross income, that's your entire income. Then you can take up to $25,000 of that passive loss to apply to your active income. Okay. Anything beyond 150 can't take any, and it kind of phases out between hundred and 150. Something to talk about. If you, if you do need that qualification, definitely speak to your accountant to see if you can take some of those extra deductions. Let's talk about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act now. Okay, any questions? I saw there was a question that came in before. Let's see if it will take it now. What if your W-2 job is for a real estate development firm? Um, it's a good question. Unless you are actually involved in your own rental properties, maybe you have to own properties to get the, the things. So you're saying, let's say you own properties and you're also working for a real estate firm. Um, but the job you're working in the real estate firm is not for your own properties. So it doesn't help unless you own a 5% or more equity ownership in that company or in the properties that, that you're involved with, then those hours don't count, unfortunately. Um, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Bonus depreciation. Basically what this says is, as we mentioned before, we're accelerating the depreciation. We're finding property that depreciates on a five-year schedule, 15-year schedule, right? Personal property, land improvements, all that stuff. Once we've identified what that is, you now have an opportunity, it's an option. You can take all of that in the first year, in one year, a lump sum of depreciation deductions. That's called 100% bonus depreciation. Instead of spreading it out over five years and doubling your depreciation, you can now take a huge amount. And let's just give a quick example. Let's say in, in our previous example, we had a $100,000 property. Actually, we'll get to it when we get to the case study. Let's just leave it like that. Bonus depreciation. Is simply put, you're taking a huge amount of that instead of spreading, you know, 20% or so over a five year period, you can take the entire 20% in the first year. Now, this is set to phase out in 2023, which means 2022 is going to be the last year where you can actually take 100% bonus depreciation. So now is the time to take advantage of it because as long as you take those huge deductions, if you don't use it this year, it's still a passive loss, still stays with you. It's like an imaginary bank account that kind of carries with you, and you can use it next year or future years until you sell a property. Um, there's another thing I'll mention here. It's a pretty important topic uh, that happened recently with the CARES Act a few months back, the onset of the pandemic, COVID. What happened was the IRS and you know, the government was trying to figure out how can we get people more money? How can we give them? We, we know we get these checks and we have these you know, stimulus checks and all that good stuff. They, 
brought in something, used to be a law years ago, but they reenacted it, something called a net operating loss carry back, okay? Net operating losses, remember, passive loss carries forward. You can use it next year. But they said you can actually now take a passive loss and carry it back. What does that mean? That means if you paid taxes in the past five years and you do a consignation this year and you get a huge tax deduction and you're, it's a passive loss because you can't apply it to any more of your income this year, but you have this huge loss, what can I do with it? You can actually go back to previous year's tax returns, amend them and apply those losses in reverse. Apply them backwards and actually get a refund check for any taxes you paid in previous years. So it's not that straightforward, not that simple. You do have to amend your tax returns to do this. You do have to file like a special form. Your accountant has to file a special form for amending that and also the, the rent, uh, the operating loss carry back in making those calculations. However, it is something possible that the IRS you know, put into play for people to get a refund check, have actually more cash when unfortunately the economy is not doing as we expected it. To do so that's something important that happened recently in the law what's going to happen going forward nobody knows so i'm not even going to touch it um when should we be doing this okay when are you doing conservation are you doing it at the beginning of the property can you do it at the end can you do it in the middle most people do it what i've seen is they try to get it done in the first year of ownership why because they want to take the tax advantages immediately right it doesn't need to be. You can actually do this retroactively. If you've owned a property for many years and you never did consultation, you're doing straight line, you can do what's called a look back study. And this is without amending your tax returns. You can actually go back and make an adjustment and catch up basically any depreciation that you missed over the past however many years, one, two, three, five, whatever, and um, get a huge tax deduction on all the accelerated depreciation that you could have taken over the previous years and get it this year. So it's similar to bonus depreciation in that respect that you can get a, a huge lump sum in one year. A lot of people reach out to me um, even while they're under contract because they'd like to see, you know, I'm planning on buying this property, Yona, what is my tax deduction is going to look like if I do a cost site? We do a free estimate, okay, so we'll be able to show you up front what, you know, do an analysis, what your potential tax benefits are going to look like, and so a lot of people get that done right away. Um, if you're doing a major renovation, now, remember I said at the beginning that your tax basis, meaning the amount you can depreciate is based on how much money was spent, your purchase price, and that's it, right? It doesn't change when you do a refinance. It doesn't change when you get a new appraisal. You buy it you know, really, really under market for a million dollars, but really it's worth $3 million. It doesn't matter. Your tax basis, how much you can depreciate, is based solely on how much money was put into it. The only time that changes is if more money is put into it. So if you actually do renovations, if you do capital improvements, you're putting more money in that property, all of that money spent is depreciated, meaning you can now take that on a depreciation schedule and deduct that over a 27 and a half year period. Or you can do a cost segregation on the amount of money that was spent on that renovation project and actually break it down into faster lives, get the bonus depreciation or get those faster deductions based on how much money was spent. Uh, new construction works as well. It's straightforward, it should be, okay? So just to reiterate, um, this can be done in retrospect. Um, and pretty much now we're, we're coming to a close. We got this case study and that's pretty much it. So if you are formulating questions, now would be the time to, to start, you know, yeah, putting them into, into uh, you know, words <laughs> and typing them out or waiting until the end and we'll turn on everyone's microphone and we can all discuss this. But we'll do a quick case study. And this case study is um, a property, 32 unit, garden style multifamily building in North Carolina, $1.75 million. Okay, this was the purchase. It was multifamily after many single family properties. The reason why I'm mentioning that is because this particular person wanted to do a 1031 exchange, selling a lot, you know, a whole, I don't remember exactly how many single family properties he had, but he had collected a lot of them and decided, forget it, I'm going all into multifamily now. And he wanted to do 1031 exchange, it failed. Okay, which means he wasn't able to identify the property in time and he had to pay capital gains tax. So he's now subject to a large capital gains tax bill of about $300,000 because he made money on the sale of those properties. What happened is we were able to do conservation. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because not only did it knock off his income, but it also was able to knock off the capital gains tax. Okay, so it doesn't just apply to your income tax. It can also apply to other things as well. So your normal depreciation over here should have been not normal, I mean straight line, if you would have just taken straight line, $54,000 a year. Okay, that's it. Which means we're, we're taking that 
1.75 million we're subtracting from land a certain amount and then dividing by 27 and a half, $54,000 a lot. But his net operating income, meaning the amount he's making of rental property income after all expenses is, is, there we go, I muted there. Um, the rental property income was about 120, I, I don't know exactly, about 120, $130,000. So that $50,000 was great. Uh, 54,000 knocked off his, his taxable liability, but he still had about, you know, 60, $70,000 of tax liability to deal with. He's going to have to pay tax on it. What we did was, and this is again, after the whole conservation study is completed, we're talking about like a hundred page report, which has in it broken down details of all the different assets, calculations, how much they're worth, et cetera. The percentage of what was finalized at the end was the 15 year property, again, that's the land improvements, landscaping, the pavement, about 8%, okay? $122,000 and change over a 15 year period. Five year property, remember that's the personal property, all the, the furniture and the uh, carpeting and the cabinets and all the you know fixtures, all the good stuff in the building, not part of the structure, five year property, 20%. Okay, so 20% over here, that's $298,000. Altogether, we're talking about $421,000 of extra depreciation that he could have accelerated. He took it all as bonus depreciation, which means he took it all upfront in the first year. Mentioned he knocked off that $120,000 of, remember what, of his income. And then the remaining $300,000 or so knocked off his capital gains tax that he thought he would have had to pay. As you would say, bada bing, bada boom, right? He's, uh, he's done, right? He took care of everything. Incredible story. The guy literally called me on the phone crying. True story. Called me on the phone with tears in his eyes. He said, I thought I was going to have to pay $300,000 to the IRS capital gains tax. You helped me. He didn't know what to do. I mean, he was really uh, literally in tears. So that's the story. This is a great story. Now, however, what happens when you sell a property? It's not all fun and games. Uncle Sam's not just trying to, uh, try to give you, you know, a lot of money for no reason, but they're incentivizing us and they are giving this. So what do you do if you have uh, if you sell your property, when you sell a property, you have something called depreciation recapture tax. Now, it's not something that everyone should get scared about. Oh, no, I have to pay back all the depreciation took. That's not what it is. It's not you're paying back. It's not you're agreeing recapture. It's that you have or subject to a tax. I'm very careful there and say you're subject to a tax. Because again, not all tax that you're subject to means you have to pay because there are many ways to get around that. But you are subject to a tax of 25% um, of the amount of the depreciation you took. So if you took a lot more depreciation up front with the bonus depreciation, yes, you're gonna be subject to a larger tax on the sale, okay? However, there are ways to get around that, like 1031 exchange, you can defer that, as well as the capital gains tax, you defer that. You can buy other properties and have more depreciation from another property and then use that extra depreciation in that year to offset capital gains, to offset depreciation recapture from another property. So there's, it's a, it's a strategy. It works best. It works best for people who are not just buying one property at a time and then selling it. It works best conservation for, um, to, for people who are in the game, right? Who are buying more than one property, who are investing in, in multiple assets. And so therefore over a, a three, five year period, they may have multiple investments. They can use depreciation from one, one to offset income from another, et cetera. It's a, uh, it's a whole process. Cause again, it lumps together the rental property income, the depreciation income lumps together and the real estate professional status is really who is going to be benefiting from this more than anyone else. Um, what, yeah, so who, what should you be looking for? Again, this is not something that you can do by yourself. This is not something that even CPAs can do by themselves. Um, there are large accounting firms that do this in-house. They have engineers in-house and they take care of this but I'd say 99% of accountants and accounting firms in the country do not do this in-house. So they hire a firm like Madison or you know, other national comp companies that do this and are professionals because the IRS has a whole you know, laundry list of in the conservation audit techniques guide, what needs to go into getting this done. There's a whole numbering system. There's a whole nomenclature that has to be used in this study. And anyone who's seen a report, you know, it's 80, 90, hundred pages long. It's very detailed as pictures, has, you know, case history, sourcing everything, uh, et cetera. It's very detailed. It's not just enough to, to throw a number at the wall and come out and say, well, I think 20% is five-year property. I'm going to take 20% of that as a tax deduction this year. Now, one could do that. I'm not saying 
you can't do anyone can do anything you want but it, if you ever get audited you'd uh, you fail and have big penalties and um, fines for doing so so play it right and get it done how much does it cost that's a good question um, did someone ask that no but I asked that how much does it cost to get a conservation study done um, typically and it's not dependent whatsoever on your tax reduction on your excuse me, your tax savings not continued whatsoever but typically for multifamily properties somewhere between four or five thousand um, dollars some is a little more of larger projects um, if there's renovation project there's an extra step in the project as well not just the acquisition but also the subsequent re renovations uh, smaller properties you know even their single families um, we're starting to price a lot lower than that especially when there's a portfolio so um there's something to do larger commercial buildings i've seen you know up to ten thousand dollars but again a hundred million dollar acquisition where you're getting you know uh, a 20 million dollar tax deduction to pay five to ten thousand dollars it is not the end of the world um so again not contingent on the tax benefit there but that's how much it would cost any other questions uh, a little bit about us we've done seventeen thousand studies across the country um, 3 billion in tax savings, pretty good track record, um, audit protection, good stuff. Questions, feel free to reach out to me, yonawice.com. Check out the Weiss Advice podcast if you, uh, if you want to hear, if you like the way I talk and you want to hear more of it, then, uh, and if you don't, you can listen to the guests and fast forward me. But um, let's get to some of these questions now. So I see Anthony asked over here. Can yeah. you use, go ahead, why don't you read it for us? Sure, sure. So I had a couple of questions. We'll get to some other folks' questions as well. Um, can you use this on single family home? Can you use this on a two family home? Is it worth it? You know, is the cost going to be too much to even worth the justification? Um, you know, especially if you're a real estate professional, is it worth it? Yeah, absolutely. The only time where conservation cannot apply is on your personal residence. But okay. any type of property whatsoever, um, whether it's a single family, whether it's a small multifamily, whether it's self storage or a retail or a golf course or, you know, assisted living, it doesn't matter. Any type of property whatsoever, you can get the benefit. Now you ask, is it going to be worth it? What, what, you know, what's the minimum threshold where it's worth it? Well, I just told you that it might cost a few thousand dollars to get this study done. Um, so on a million dollars, let's just take it like this, on a right. million dollar purchase price, you're looking at a minimum of $150,000 of tax benefit. Okay. That would make sense. So if you, if you divide that by, by 10, a hundred thousand dollar purchase price, you get maybe 10, $15,000 tax benefit. Is it worth to pay a few thousand dollars to get a $10,000 tax benefit? Probably not. I mean, it, 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 it kind of washes itself out. You know, it, it's kind of like, you know, pushing, pushing the pennies there. I typically recommend anything purchased for over half a million dollars, or if you have a portfolio and you're doing, you know, a bunch of single families together, it's definitely worthwhile to look into. And it can't hurt to get a free analysis, a free estimate to see the numbers for yourself and see if it makes sense. So um, yes, it definitely can work. Okay. Um, I had a couple more questions, but let's get to Jerry. You had a question. When when you saw it was your cost basis reduced by the depreciation taken up front was this question yes so you're well if you're doing an exchange if you're doing a 1031 exchange yes your cost basis is reduced by the amount of depreciation that you took so your cost basis on and when you do a 1031 exchange basically you're exchanging one property for another normally your depreciation when you buy a new property is based on the purchase price in an exchange you take that purchase price and you uh, subtract the gain, okay, the overall gain, which is not only how much money you made from, you know, the gain of the sale, but also um, how much depreciation you took over the course of ownership. So that's where you're going to get your new basis for your new property. You take the purchase price and subtract the overall gain. That's going to be your new basis. So if you add uh, more money into uh, the exchange, you take a loan and you get that, you can actually use, use that towards the, the new basis. Anyone else have any questions? I have a few more, but let's open it up a little more. Yeah, no, um, how, how do you typically, um, or the engineer, whoever, come to the land allocation? I know you said it's usually 15%. How do they usually come up with that? So that's a great question. There, um, we, I used 15% over here, and that's the national average. So how does one come up with that? There are a number of methods for determining that. The IRS does not give any one single method 
that they say you, know, you need to use. But they do recognize many different methods um, are appropriate for coming up with that land allocation. And it's gonna depend a lot on you know, where it's located, how much land there is. Uh, sometimes people use a uh, third party appraisal. We're not land appraisals, appraisers, so we actually don't come up with, with that number. We can, and most accounting firms that I've worked with, I'd say you know, the major accounting firms in the country, they just have a set fixed you know, number that they apply. All properties, land value is 20% or 15% or 10%, it doesn't matter. And so they you know, claim that as like an industry standard you know, fixed land allocation. There are certain locations where it might be more difficult to claim that. Um, like I mentioned, California, for example, is notorious for having very high land allocations. Um, I've seen literally like 40, 50, 60%. So you might wanna look at county assessors. Some people look at um, appraisers, et cetera. Thank you. A question from uh, Yovi. If your strategy is to hold on to the property more than five years, is it worth it doing a cost set? Um, again, it, it depends on what's your overall strategy. I don't like to think of cost creation as just a one, you know, one property. Uh, it's not going to work best for you if you're just doing one property and planning on holding it for a long term. It may not be best. It may be best in that case to take an equal amount of depreciation you know, over the, the course of ownership. It's gonna depend on your overall situation. Um, but if you are planning on buying more properties, then it can help you to get more cash flow to be able to have that leverage, that buying power to, uh, you know, to invest more. Yeah, and so if you're, if you're working on a value add um, deal, it's called a multifamily deal, you bought it, you took the bonus depreciation, and then maybe in the next year, you invested, you bought it for a million dollars and you invested another 200,000. Do you have to just update the cost segregation report and break out um, obviously all the personal property and all the elements that go along with it? Um, or you, you order a brand new report. How does that work? So everybody knows. Absolutely. So yeah, like I said, there is like a supplemental report that we do um, based on the amount that was spent on the renovations. So it's not an entirely new report. It's usually just like a fraction of the cost. Um, but yeah, update that based on however much money was spent. Update report, great. Anyone else have anything? Any more questions? No, we all, we're all cost seg experts. <laughs> it's clear, it's crystal clear, right? <laughs> no, this is great. Um, if nobody has Good any question. more questions, Good question. It's Uvi here. Uh, and what average, uh, let's say, a comparison of uh, tax savings, whether you're using straight line versus cost segregation in, in a scheme of, I don't know, portfolio of fifty, hundred million dollars, let's say. If you have any, just an idea, top, more of a big picture. So, so as I mentioned, for every million dollars, there's usually an after-tax benefit of, uh, of $150,000 um, tax benefit on average. So if you have a $50 million portfolio, you know, you're looking at a, a very large uh, tax benefit there. So you were saying 50% in addition to straight line depreciation method? Yeah, for sure. Okay. In those, in those, you know, and the benefit's going to be in the, in the early years, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? No? The, the most important thing, how much does it cost? <laughs> um, yeah, so I mentioned before, per property, uh, we look at each property separately, and it's a kind of scope of work type, type fee. Uh, one-time flat fee per property, usually typically for multifamily properties, somewhere in the range of, uh, you know, four to $5,000. If there's a portfolio, we can definitely, you know, cut down that cost. And, and like I mentioned, for uh, single families, especially when there's portfolio, we're, we're doing much more, uh, you know, a much more benefited cost uh, for those type properties. Great. Right. So he's basically saying it's totally worth it to, to do this as, as many times as you can. But again, Yoni said, it depends upon your, your long-term goals. So um, 
you know, that makes a lot of sense to me, especially if you're um, a real estate professional, it definitely provides more benefits than not. Um, anybody else before we wrap up with Yona here? We've only got a couple, couple minutes. No? Okay. All right. Well, with that being said, um, thank you again, everybody, for taking uh, an hour of your time. Again, this is two days in a row um, for the uh, Multifamily Investor Association. And basically, I meet up, I run through my company, Red Knight Properties. And uh, again, thank you, Yona, for coming on. Uh, really appreciate it. And Yona's email is right there. So yeah, if anyone wants to reach out. Uh, definitely encourage you guys to reach out to him. And like he said, every time that, you know, I'm evaluating a property, I usually, I'd hit up, you know, Yona and ask, okay, what does it look like? You know, what, what do you think the bonus depreciation is going to look like? And, um, you know, what are the benefits going to look like? So he does provide that free of charge. And then when you're ready to rock and roll, you just formalize the report with the engineers. So, um, so that's a great, great benefit of working with someone like Yona and his team at Madison. Um, so again, Yona, thanks for coming on. Um, I recorded this. So if you guys want to rewatch it, it was a great presentation. I'll, I'll post it on, uh, if it's okay, Yona, on social media. So it gets, you know, gets around as well. 100%. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Anthony. Appreciate you uh, putting this together and great to meet you all. And, uh, if we're not connected yet on LinkedIn. That's, that's where you can find me the most. So Thank check you. me out. Check us out there. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Yona. Thank you guys. Have a good one. Thanks. Thank you.